from them we maybe there's maybe mandatory that they have to sing I'm not sure but maybe that's what we need to do with the adults to say okay today you got to sing oh <laughs> yeah I have Jeremy says I've been trying that for a while so can't help it sorry there's a couple others that would say the same thing let's turn now to 438 after the first first, make someone welcome.
seated. Good to see you all this morning. God bless you. Take a look at your announcements in the bulletin. This Saturday coming up, guys, we're going to have a work day. If you're a guy and can help us a little bit with some gutter issues and some clearing out some brush issues back behind the church, we sure would appreciate your help. If you can spare some time for us, we'd like to have you come and do that. That'll be this coming up Saturday. Out in the foyer, there's a sign-up sheet for the church directory. That'll be the end of March, March 19th and 20th. Sure do appreciate everybody that's signed up already. But if you haven't or if you're still thinking about that, you can check that out and see what time might be good for you all day Saturday and then Sunday afternoon into the evening. I'd like to get everybody that would be part of that to be part of that. So just be looking at that and thinking about that coming up. Um, appreciate that very, very much, everybody that's involved in that. We have an opportunity this morning to participate in the Lord's Supper, and that's what we're going to do in just a moment. So as I pray, if our brother is going to be distributing the elements this morning, if they would come forward during this prayer time. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be gathered together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for this first song that reminds us that heaven came down. Jesus came to us to reveal you, the Father, to us, to remind us of our great need, that we've sinned, that we've come short of the glory of God, and at the same time to remind us of your great provision for our need. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and we each one of us here, so grateful, so indebted to you for the great gift of salvation that we have through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to this time, to this table, none of us is worthy. All of us has failed. And yet, as we think about his shed blood, his broken body, we're reminded that our sins are forgiven that we're a forgiven people because of his provision, because of your plan, Father. And as we partake this morning, help us to rejoice in the fact that our sins are forgiven, that it's true the wages of sin is death, but it's even more true that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we just thank you and praise you, Father, that once again we can come to this table equally sinners, equally saved by the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As old preacher said years ago down south that I heard, the ground is level at the cross. We come to you with our great need, but we also come to you Rejoicing that that need has been met sufficiently, eternally, personally through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our brothers will distribute. And let's all wait until we've all received and then we'll partake together. Sixty-six. We'll sing that. The ladies have been playing with it, and I just want to sing it. So let's turn there.
I'm sure glad he led that because I didn't know it. <laughs> Let's turn now to 296. Will the ushers come on the last verse, please? 296.
practice this. He said, Daddy may sing begs this morning. I think Mama may too. I don't know. <laughs> so whatever you get is what you get. Thank you all for that. Appreciate that very, very much. 
you have a Bible, let's find John chapter 16 this morning. 16th chapter of John's Gospel. We'll also be looking at a couple of verses in chapter 14 and maybe one in chapter 15, but they're all right together, which makes it convenient for us this morning. John 16, beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. When he has come, he will reprove the world, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin because they believe not on me. Righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, the Spirit of truth, He will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of Himself. Whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He'll show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and shall show it unto you. A couple of weeks ago, I was down in the basement going through some boxes, basically looking for financial stuff and tax stuff because that's, that's coming up on us pretty quick. And you know how it is when you go through boxes that you haven't looked in in a long time, you always find stuff you didn't know was there. And so that turns any process into a longer process. And I was going through, and at first I found this little um, Florida gator sleeper, jumper thing that Wyatt wore when he was just a few months old, you know, and I looked at that and thought about him when he was just a little baby, came home from the hospital and all that. Then I found a music CD that I'd recorded years ago, had some great instrumental music, some Doyle Dykes, if you know who Doyle Dykes is, great guitar player. I'd forgot I had that, so I had to sit down and listen to that for a while. And uh, then I found one of Andrew's Bible school certificates. He's 34. (laughs) And I thought about that for a little bit. I uh, found a funeral card from 2002, a funeral I'd preached for a good friend of mine that I'd gone to high school with, and I sat with a tear on my eye and thought about him for a little bit. And um, I was processing all that stuff, and then I found something that we used to use quite a bit and um, don't use much anymore. It's called a phone book. And I probably wouldn't have noticed the phone book, but there was a dollar bill sticking out of the phone book. Well, I opened it up, and and the dollar bill, it was a real dollar. I've been in there for years, bookmark. And, and the dollar was stuck in the yellow pages where churches were. And just on a whim, I looked in the, in the churches. There were 17 churches in the Pinckneyville area, 17, different denominations and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if those churches, those 17 churches in the Pinckneyville area were like that church in the book of Acts? that first church in Jerusalem. And then I noticed that out of the 17 churches, eight of them were Baptist churches. And I thought to myself, man, wouldn't it be great if those eight Baptist churches were like that first church in the book of Acts? And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if just one of them was? Like that church in the book of Acts. You remember it started there. There's just about 120 people, probably less than we got here today. And the 11 disciples and and Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they took his body down from the cross. Maybe Mary, Martha, and Lazarus was in that group. We don't know for sure. Some of the other women and and people who traveled around with Jesus, just 120 people were praying and, and waiting to see what God would do next. And then they were the ones that saw the church grow from 120 to several thousand in just a very short time. And you read that and you think, what was that all about? How did that happen? You know, they didn't have any building. They didn't have any budgets. They didn't have any buses. How did they do that? Well, Jesus tells us right here how they did it. Jesus said that the secret to their success and the secret to all spiritual success is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the largest or the most emphasized aspect of Jesus' teaching here at this time. Remember what's going on. We're going all the way to Easter. 
We're taking John 13 through 19, where John meticulously details the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And they've moved from the upper room now. They just did the Last Supper, which we reminisce on with the Lord's Supper. And they're moving towards the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to pray and be betrayed and arrested and all that that's coming up. He knows that's coming. They don't. And when he teaches them in John 14, 15, 16, he teaches several subjects, but the one he spends the most time on, he comes back to it three different points in their, in their walking and talking together, and that's the Holy Spirit. He talks to them about the reality of the Holy Spirit. What is the reality of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit, number one, is God. Uh, several times in these verses we've read and the ones we'll look at, Words are used, titles are used to tell tell us, to teach us, to remind us that the reality of the Holy Spirit is that He is God, the third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's called the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth here. He's called uh, Counselor or Helper, depending on which version you read. And the way those titles or those names are used, the way they're applied, is they're given the same level of deity as the Son, as the Father. So the Holy Spirit is God. And He's also a person. The reality of the Holy Spirit, not only is He a God, but He is a person. I counted these up in chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16 the personal references Jesus makes, the personal pronouns, nearly 30. For instance, he says here that um, in, in verse 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of Himself, and so on and so forth. Verse 14, He shall glorify Me. So if me is a personal pronoun referring to a person called Jesus, then he is a personal pronoun referring to a person called the Holy Spirit. So if if you're going to use a a consistent interpretation there, the Holy Spirit is not only God, but he's a person, the third person of the Godhead. A third thing he taught them about the reality of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit's at work. He's got a work to do. He uses terms here like guide, guide, Uh, convict, help, teach, speak, remind, glorify. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into truth, to teach us about truth, to remind us about truth, to point people to Jesus who is the truth, and that's His work. And then the third or the fourth thing He says here, the Holy Spirit is here. Verse 7, I tell you the truth, it's expedient. Some versions say it's to your advantage. Some versions say it's your benefit. The Living Bible, the old paraphrase Living Bible says it's best for you. That's a paraphrase, but I kind of like that. He says it's best for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, depending on which version you're reading, will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Just think if Jesus was in a body today on planet earth. You and I wouldn't get to spend 30 seconds with Him in our whole lifetime, probably. I mean, the line would be from here to Africa, people standing in line to see Jesus. You think about the Pope, or you think about Billy Graham, or you think about some athlete, or some celebrity, and people standing in line to see Him, just to get a look at Him, just to get a picture taken with Him, a selfie, or get get Him to to sign their, uh, their autograph book or whatever. If Jesus was alive today, we couldn't get close to Him. But because of the Holy Spirit... Living inside us, we have access to the presence of God in heaven 24-7, 365. So he said, it's best for you, it's expedient, it's to your advantage, it's to your benefit that I go away. So what he's doing here is he is showing these disciples the reality of the Holy Spirit. He'd been with them for three years, now he's going away. He's going to send the Spirit back to abide with them forever, to indwell them, to lead them, to guide them, to instruct them, to give them all that they need to glorify Him on planet earth. That was the secret to their spiritual success, and He, the Holy Spirit, is the secret to all spiritual success. If you or I are going to succeed in the spiritual life, if we're going to be a godly person, a godly 
husband or wife, a godly parent, a godly person in the workplace, a godly brother or sister in Christ in the church, it's going to be directly related to our relationship to the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing more, nothing else. That's the way it's going to be. So the revelation of the Holy Spirit is so important to these disciples and us. Now turn back to chapter 14. And let's look at a couple of these other passages real quick because I'm short of time, and I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to take a little time to, to show this. Because a lot of people struggle in their spiritual life. How, how do I succeed? How, how do I accomplish things? How, how do I grow? How do I become? How do I move past my past? How do I move through my struggles? How do I get over habits and hang-ups? How do I become more faithful? How do I become more what God wants me to be? Many people have a desire for that, but the desire is never developed because they don't understand. It's not through trying harder or doing better, but depending on the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do in and through people who are yielded to Him, submitted to Him, and obedient to Him. So in chapter 14, verse 16, this is where Jesus begins to discuss uh, with the disciples the reality of the Holy Spirit. And he gives them a revelation that we live in today that I think a lot of Christians don't understand. I want to point this out. It's so important to see this. Verse 16, I will pray the Father. So the Holy Spirit coming is a direct answer to Jesus' prayer. And how many of you all know Jesus always gets what he prays for? So he's going to pray the Father, and he shall give you, there's another thing, the Holy Spirit's a gift to you and I, and the Holy Spirit who comes into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds, into our very being, when we accept Jesus Christ, we don't get the Holy Spirit on the installment plan. We receive the Spirit when we receive Jesus Christ. He's a gift to us, and he gifts us so that we can live this life. He says, I'll pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. The word another there means another of the same kind. Exactly the same in essence. There's two Greek words for another. One means different, one means the same. And this is the word that means the same. So Jesus is saying, when I go away... I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to send the Comforter. He's going to give the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to be exactly like me. So those of us who have trusted Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, dwelling in us. That's the presence of Jesus Christ to live the life of Jesus Christ in these earthly bodies in this world. Fascinating. He says, I'll give you another Comforter that He may abide with you forever. And never leave you for sake. That's how you know you're sealed with the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. You can't lose your salvation because you didn't do anything to get it in the first place. The Holy Spirit comes in and He's the guarantee. He's the earnest money. He's the down payment that God's going to finish what He started in your life and my life too. Even verse 17, the Spirit of truth. Now here's the key thing. Whom the world cannot receive. There is an unholy spirit. There is a spirit of the world. There is a spirit of this age. There is a spirit of darkness. And that's totally separate. So the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it sees Him not, neither knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and shall be in you. Now look at those two prepositions, with and in. There's propositions in the prepositions. There's pictures in the prepositions. Up to this point, the Holy Spirit, who is God, Genesis 1-2, He hovered over the waters in creation. And he was with the people of God. He was with Abraham. He was with Moses. He was with David. He was with Ezekiel. He was with Daniel. He was with Hosea. He was with Joel. He was with Amos. He was with Obadiah. He was with Jonah. He was with Micah. And on and on I could go, I won't. But he was with them. And he would come upon them. David would write a psalm or kill a giant or Samson take a jawbone of a donkey and whoop up on some Philistines. You know what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit would come on them and they would do exploits for God. But Jesus says in verse 17, there's coming a time when the Holy Spirit's not just going to be with you, He's going to be in you. Now we live in that time. Since the day of Pentecost, that's the way it's been. The Holy Spirit's not just with, He's in, and He's in you, and He's in me, and He's in the children of God, and He's not in the world. You see that in verse 17? This is a revelation. We sort of think the Holy Spirit's just moving around tapping people on the shoulder. No. 
The Holy Spirit is in you and in me and in us. And if the world is going to know who Jesus is, it's the people who have the Spirit of God that are going to have to reveal that to the world. The Holy Spirit's main ministry today is filling the believer and then the believer filled with the Holy Spirit, being yielded to the Holy Spirit, being submitted to the Holy Spirit, being obedient to the Holy Spirit, going out into the world and showing the world who Jesus is. So if the world sees Jesus and they're drawn to Him because they see something in us they can't explain, that's powerful, that's beautiful. And so he says, he sh- He's with you and He shall be in you. Now remember, there's six biblical pictures of the Holy Spirit. Six pictures the Bible gives us the Holy Spirit. Wind. Now the Holy Spirit's not wind, but He moves like wind. There's water. The Holy Spirit's not water, but He cleanses like water. He's the Holy Spirit. There's uh, fire. The Holy Spirit's not fire, but He purges like fire. He burns away all that's not like Jesus so that all that's left in you and me is what looks like Jesus, what sounds like Jesus, what acts like Jesus, what walks like Jesus, what talks like Jesus. That's the fire. Then there's the idea of the dove. Holy Spirit's not a dove, but He brings peace like a dove. There's oil. The Holy Spirit's not oil, but He soothes like oil. And then the Holy Spirit is not only water and wind and fire and dove and oil, but He's wine. The Holy Spirit's not wine, but He influences like wine. When you're filled with the Spirit, it's like being inebriated. It's like being intoxicated. You're no longer your own. You're yielded to Him. And whatever He wants to do in and through you, you say, here I am, Lord, use me. Any way you see fit, anything you want to do, I am yours. I am a vessel. I am open to you to be filled by you, to be poured out by you. And so the revelation of the Holy Spirit here in John 14, 26, is that He's with you, disciples, but He's going to be in you. Oh, I'm running out of time. John chapter 20. Flip over there real quick. My, my, my. The reason I want to sort of park on this thing a minute is if you had a recipe and you left one ingredient out, it'd mess up your whole cake. And a lot of Christians have left the Holy Spirit out. Messed up your whole life. And the Holy Spirit was given for the purpose of revealing Jesus Christ to the world. So in John 20, this is after the resurrection, he says in verse uh, 22, He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. They didn't receive the Spirit at that point, but that's the promise. Jesus began saying, Now it's time. I've gone to the cross, died for the sins, risen, ascended, Now I'm the resurrected Christ. Now begin receiving the Holy Spirit. Flip back to Luke chapter 24 real quick. This is still Jesus preaching, teaching in those 40 days after He resurrected. So, He has on the night of His betrayal and arrest taught them the reality of the Holy Spirit. He's God. He's a person. He's at work. He's here. But then he gives them this revelation. He's with you, but he's going to be in you. So he says to them in John 20, begin receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luke 24, 49. 24, 49. And he says, behold, I send the promise. Now there's a key word right there. I will now send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Now, flip on over to Acts chapter 1. Because Luke wrote Luke and Luke wrote Acts. So Luke's going to give us the prequel and the sequel here. Both ends of the stick. And every stick's got two ends. So Luke says, Luke 24, 49, Jesus, when He gave them the commission, wait for the promise of the Father. That is, the Holy Spirit's not going to be with you anymore. He's going to be in you. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which you've heard of me. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in verse 8, 
you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So, the secret to their spiritual success was the fact that they responded obediently to the word of Jesus Christ to wait for the promise, to receive that promise, and then to go out into the world in the power of that promise and to reveal Jesus Christ to people who didn't know Him. Back to John 16. When we read John 16, the verses we started with just a moment ago, Jesus said, I'm going away. If I don't go away, verse 7, the Comforter won't come. But when I go away, I will send Him to you. And verse 8, when He is come, that is, when He comes in this new revelation, this new dimension, not just the Holy Spirit as God with people, but the Holy Spirit as God in people, He will reprove or convict, convince the world. Why? Because the world cannot receive the Spirit. The only people that receive the Spirit is people who come to Jesus Christ and receive Jesus Christ and He puts His Spirit in them. Then those people have the responsibility of ministering to the world. So the world is going to be convinced of sin. Notice verse 8, not sins, sin. What is that sin? It is the sin of unbelief. It is the only sin that sends a person to hell. The sin of unbelief. Rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of little sins can come out of the big sin. But the world has that sin. They reject Him. But we who know Him, we reveal to them that He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we reveal to them the fact that they have sinned because they believe not on me, verse 9, of righteousness, that is, Jesus is the righteous one because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And then of judgment. There's a judgment coming. The people who reject Him, judgment. The people that stay in their sin, judgment. How are they going to know the difference? You and me. The people who have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. Many times we're just sitting around waiting for the Holy Spirit to go get somebody. And the Holy Spirit's waiting for you to go get somebody. And see, we've lost that. It's a missing ingredient. We just think if we can just meet and just meet and just meet and just meet and just meet, that eventually everybody comes. It doesn't work that way. We've got to go. We've got to go. We've got to minister. So we, the people of God, filled with the Spirit of God, we convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Because Jesus Christ is localized in your body, in my body, in your life, and in my life. We are the people of God. We are left on this planet to go out into the world and demonstrate to people what it means to be a person of God, a person that belongs to God. That's the point that he's making here. A brand new revelation. And we still don't get it, many of us. When I was going through my boxes in the basement, I found some old newspaper clippings. I used to play a little basketball. And... uh, you know how your mind sort of, like Todd says, the older I get, the better I was. It's kind of like, you know, your mind sort of drifts sometimes, and you, and you kind of daydream. You, you're thinking about it. And I remember one particular time I was standing at the free throw line at Thomas Gymnasium. I was dribbling the ball, getting ready to shoot. And over here to my left, there became this big chant from this side of Thomas Gymnasium. We got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? And then from this other side, we got spirit, yes we do, we got spirit, how about you? And that got to going back so much, I couldn't even concentrate dribbling a basketball, shooting a free throw. But the idea of spirit, the church can make that chant. We've got spirit, the spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? They don't have the spirit. They don't know Jesus. They don't know God. They don't have forgiveness of sin. They don't have the assurance of eternal life. They don't have that, but we do. And that's the idea. So the the secret to spiritual success is twofold. Number one, do you have the Spirit? You do if you have Jesus. If you've come to the cross 
and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Spirit of God. Second side is, does the Spirit have you? Have you given yourself? Have you yielded yourself? It's what sometimes the old authors call the surrendered life or the submitted life or whatever. A lot of people have the Spirit of God. They're going to heaven. But does the Spirit of God have you? Have you given yourself to Him? All of your life, your talents, your gifts, your abilities, your time. Have you yielded your life? Have you surrendered? Have you submitted? Have you said, Lord Jesus, here I am. Fill me and use me in whatever way you see fit. That's what the world's waiting to see. That was the secret to their spiritual success. On that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that first church, when they were sharing the gospel, people said, what is this? What does this mean? Because they heard all these people speaking about Jesus Christ in their own languages, in their own dialects. It was a miracle of the Spirit. They were under the influence of the Spirit. They were empowered by the Spirit. And everybody showed up and 3,000 people got saved in one day because there was a people who had the Spirit, but there were also people that had yielded their life to the Spirit. Like Richard Green, my evangelist friend from South Africa, always says, is the Holy Spirit resident or is the Holy Spirit president in your life? Maybe you're here today and you need to yield your life in some way to the Holy Spirit of God. You need to stop drawing a line on God and saying, this is as far as I'm going with you and just erase that line and just come on across and begin walking with God and talking with God in a way you never have before. You say, what's my problem? Why do I struggle? Why can't I have spiritual success? Why do I have so much defeat? Why do I have this? Maybe you just need to surrender yourself to the Lord who loves you today. Give Him all of you there is to give. And allow Him to become the one who authors your success, your victories in life. Be faithful to Him. Be yielded to Him. Be submitted to Him in a way you never have before. And I guarantee you, you will see victories and success like you never have before. Do you trust God? Do you believe He would do that? If you come to Him, He will. He promises to. And they learned that. I mean, think about it. There's Peter. He's the old denier. Think about all the disciples. They forsook Jesus and fled at the cross. But a few days later, because of the power of the Holy Spirit being yielded to God's will, God's purpose, God's plan, they turned the world upside down. The world who does not know and who will not know outside of you and I yielded to the Spirit serving Him. That's what it's all about. The secret to spiritual success is your degree of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. I said this for many years. Right now, everybody here has as much God as they want. Do you want a little bit more? Do you want to surrender a little bit more? Do you want to serve a little bit more? Then you can. He's ready. He's ready to fill you. He's ready to use you in whatever way you see fit. He's waiting on you. Resident, president. Do you have him? Does he have you? That's what it's all about this morning. That was the secret to their spiritual success. And that is the secret to all spiritual success. The Holy Spirit living in you. Paul would say it this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul would say, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's Galatians 2.20. I could quote verses till noon. I won't. The point is, your success in the Christian life, your victory in Christian living, is totally dependent on your yieldedness, submissiveness, surrender, and obedience to the Holy Spirit of God. We read the verse last week, John 15. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. That is nothing of spiritual significance. So He's waiting on us to yield ourselves to Him. And then He'll fill us, use us, and glorify Himself in the world. He'll use you and me and us and we to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Father, we're thankful for this promise of the Holy Spirit.
The Christian life is impossible without the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is a struggle without the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is defeat without the Holy Spirit. The Christian life without the Holy Spirit degenerates into ritualism and religiosity and traditions and denominational structures. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life. There's just existence. There's just habit, routine, formalism, dryness. But as we surrender ourselves to you, submit ourselves to you, yield ourselves to you, as we allow the Holy Spirit to have more and more of us, there's a success, a spiritual success. There's a vitality. There's an authority in the spirit realm. There's a power that comes from you. And Jesus, like you said on that night, of the Holy Spirit, He shall glorify me. And I like what old Vance Hadmer used to say, the Holy Spirit brags on Jesus. Lord, raise up a people, whether it's this church or one of those other Baptist churches in Pinckneyville or one of those other denominational churches in Pinckneyville. Surely out of 17 churches, there ought to be a church with some people that want to have spiritual success. Surely in one of those churches, there ought to be some people that want to have some spiritual success. Hopefully, Lord, in this church, there are some people that want to have some spiritual success. They want to be yielded. They want to be obedient. They want to glorify You. They want to have the Holy Spirit have all of them that there is to have. And this is what You taught us that night. And this is what You're still trying to teach us 2,000 years later. The secret to spiritual success is not really a secret at all. It's just being obedient to the Holy Spirit of God in increasing measure over increments of time. Help us, Father, each one of us to respond to Your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name. Ruby, what number will we sing? 238. Let's stand together and make this our hymn of commitment, our hymn of decision. As we sing, you respond. If God is leading you, if you need to come, you come as we sing.
Hey, if you would, move across and take somebody by the hand. Let's have a closing prayer. We're going to be praying tonight at 6 o'clock. If you'd like to come back, we'll have a time of worship and then prayer. I know you all believe in prayer. So come back if you can, and we'll pray together as a church. Try to do that once a month or so. So come back if you can. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who leads us, who guides us, who encourages us, strengthens us, and always causes us, as Paul said, to triumph in Jesus Christ. We go through struggles, we go through darkness, we go through dryness, we go through difficult times. But the Holy Spirit always causes us to win, to be victorious, to have spiritual success. Anything we do as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a person in the church, it's going to be successful because of He, the Holy Spirit. The only person on planet Earth who knows everything about me and still loves me. He said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Help us to yield our life to a person like that, the third person of the Godhead, the very presence of Jesus Christ living inside us. Help us, Lord, to sense that, surrender to that, and to walk in the fullness and the freedom of that. Thank you, Father. If you'd have sent your son and he'd have died on the cross and risen, we could have gone to heaven. But what would we have done between here and the hereafter? How would we have lived as weak, as impotent, as not knowing? And yet you've not abandoned us. As Jesus said, I won't leave you comfortless, literally orphans, but I will come to you. And you have, and you do, and you are. And we thank you for your presence here this morning. Pray, Lord, as we go out into the world today and the week to come, that you would remind us continually by the Spirit that you're using us to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Father, we thank you and praise you. Dismiss us now in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.